Today we will talk about the history of world trade. We will discuss world trade in relation to certain products. As much as possible, products that will catch your interest. Which country has spread how much of these around the world? For example, the Dutch and the Portuguese. Why were they so successful for a period? How did England establish its colonies? We will discuss these topics. Let's see how world trade has developed. Welcome. The first and most valuable product in the world is salt. Of course, precious metals were important, but salt was extremely valuable. So much so that at one point in Rome, the salaries of legionnaires or mercenaries were paid in salt. In fact, the word salt comes from the Latin root sal, which is also the origin of the word salary in English. Many places where salt was extracted also start with the word sala, sas, sas gida, and sas der. Salt was being extracted in these cities. On one hand, salt was important for nomadic people. This is because they would rub salt on meat to cut off its contact with the air while on the move and to reduce moisture. On one hand, there is a similar thing in Turkey as well. I have also seen it in Germany. In fact, I had visited the one in Germany. They found healing in salt caves. Therefore, salt was something very magical. The payment of salaries with salt was for this reason. In ancient Greece, Salt was something that was served to guests along with bread. It was a sign of generosity. Then, during the Roman period, we placed another father next to salt. Until the 19th century, it was a greater indicator of wealth than salt. At one point, it was even more valuable than gold. I will say something very absurd to you, pepper. You won't believe it, but we started the history of world trade with pepper and salt. The topic of spices is, indeed, a rival to the Silk Road. There are two routes that developed world trade, the Silk Road and the Spice Route. I will display their routes on the screen. Therefore, salt and pepper were very valuable. In the Middle Ages, the nobility of the wealthy was evident in the variety of spices and pepper on their tables. Now, you know how when you go to restaurants, the waiters ask if they can sprinkle some more pepper for you. That culture goes all the way back to that time. But imagine having one kilogram of pepper on the table. One kilogram of pepper. Can you even fathom that? There were times when pepper was used as currency. In fact, in England and Northern Europe, taxes were paid with pepper. And we see in those films where treasures are brought to the king, often with cinnamon and pepper instead of gold, as a form of bribery. They bring pepper and cinnamon. So why were pepper and cinnamon so valuable? Why was pepper valuable? Because while salt could be found everywhere, today you can even extract salt in Norway. Pepper was not available from the sea or lakes. It came from very distant places. Therefore, since pepper came from a distant place, its price was constantly increasing. I will explain the routes to you shortly. Normally, something that costs $10 per kilogram in its home country could be so difficult to transport that by the time it arrived, it could go up to $1,000. I might have exaggerated again. Perhaps it increased by 10 times. Because... Along the route, it either faced plundering by the Mongols, or as you will see later, the Ottomans were collecting tribute, or the Mamluks were taking their share. While all this was happening, the Ottomans were extorting, or let's say, collecting taxes. However, considering that Barbaros Hayreddin was a pirate at one time, this statement isn't entirely incorrect. As we progressed into the Middle Ages, and as more products came through the Spice Route and the Silk Road, various spices like ginger, saffron, and clove began to enter European cuisine. However, the problem was that they were introduced in a rather uncouth manner. So, for example, if you take a duck, and coat it in whatever bedding, adding cinnamon, cloves, ginger, and whatever else. If you happen to find a medieval cookbook online, you'll see that if the recipe is 50 lines long, 40 of those lines are just spices. They add so many spices just to show off their wealth. The true flavor of the thing is not apparent, because during that time, it was very natural to suppress the taste or smell of certain things. Cinnamon is also present in this European history, but it has never reflected in Turkish history. It is believed that cinnamon was used in Europe, where hygiene was a problem, and people did not wash often to mask unpleasant odors, much like the emergence of perfume. In fact, during the plague, there were those long, famous masks. And it is known that cinnamon, cloves, and various herbs were placed at the ends of those masks to avoid the smell of corpses outside, symbolizing doctors in Venice especially at the end of those long masks. Spices were used to prevent that odor from reaching their noses. Pepper was a means of payment in place of gold.
it was its rival. Pepper was actually something that kings bequeathed during the Middle Ages. They left behind gold. They also bequeathed Pepper to their grandchildren, sons, and descendants. I don't know how Pepper became a plague in Europe. The Crusades, the purpose of the First Crusade was actually to save the holy tombs, to rescue Jerusalem, and so on. However, the Europeans who went there and experienced Arab culture noticed that the food there was not bland like theirs. How was Europe feeding itself at that time? Beer, which I will explain shortly. Porridge, in the mornings. There were no spices at all. There is some salt, just a little, and there is no difference between breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Even children are drinking beer instead of water or wine because they consume spirits, meaning ethyl alcohol, which we now refer to by another name that I cannot say right now, or let me say raka. These distilled things like whiskey come later. But those who went with the Crusades brought back some spices from there. Then they realized that the Arabs do not cultivate these themselves. They go and get it from the Far East via India or from some islands through India. Thus, Europe gradually begins to enrich its cuisine under the pretext of the Crusades. The Crusades have other benefits as well. They learn about gunpowder, both from the Arabs and through the Arabs from the Chinese. Paper, mathematics, accounting, decimal units, numbers, astronomy, physics. They receive so much information about these that it triggers geographical discoveries to such an extent that, after a while, becoming workers in Arab culture becomes a necessity for them. Later, while the Abbasids were settled in one place, the Umayyads had made their way to the region of Spain via Africa. No matter how much Europe wanted to distance itself from the Arabs, Arab culture ended up at their doorstep. It came to them from the far west. Moreover, they learned to wear clothing from the Arabs. The Arabs were also learning about textile concepts like silk, taffeta, damask, velvet from the east. These terms entered Arabic into European culture. Previously, the people wore uniform clothing made from fabrics obtained from their colonies and both the palace and the public dressed in the same way. There was not much variety. But later, beads, ornaments and silk fabrics began to enter the French and Spanish courts, or to the Dutch, the Portuguese. Ports were important. Look, Germany was relatively a poorer country compared to the others. The reason was that the products coming from the ports were being sold to Germany at a premium. But the Portuguese, Dutch, Italians and Venetian traders were all port cities, the Spaniards. Since they were ports, everything came directly to them first. They were going into Europe, multiplying two or three times. This caused more money to leave the country. The richest people of that time were the Venetian merchants. Why? The main entry to Italy was through the port of Venice. The shortest route comes from there because of that, from Egypt via Suez, through Syria, and boom, Venice. Venetian merchants are not foolish. So, if they are holding themselves at the fountain, of course, they were selling at a profit. This is also referenced in Game of Thrones. If you remember, there was a wealthy, non-involved in battles, constantly rich, seafaring crew, but the wealth of the Venetians will not last forever. According to what is said, one third of the wealth of the Venetians came from pepper, through spices and from pepper. They sell at such exorbitant prices that they generate incredible wealth. Now, let me explain it to you on the map. Black pepper originates from the Maluku Islands and India. Arab traders bring it to Syria and Egypt. From there, Venetian sailors transport it to Italy. Italy is already the central hub of Mediterranean trade. For this reason, Mediterranean pirates primarily plundered these goods, and places like Malta were intended to be kept secure as key points. This is related to the Knights of Malta and such matters. The alternative to the overland route is via the Indian Ocean to Egypt, then to Syria, during which time it passes through the Suez Canal to Alexandria, and from there again by ship to Venice. So what happens after arriving in Venice? It flows towards Central and Northern Europe over the Alps. As we progress along this route, the prices of everything are increasing. Throughout history, as the Mamluks dominated Egypt and the Turks controlled Anatolia, more taxes were levied on the trade route especially because transportation was carried out by caravan between Suez and Alexandria, those who collected the taxes became wealthy. Of course, this was further increasing the shipping costs. In the day 15th century, pepper that left India became 30 times more expensive by the time it reached Venice. In the century, 
Vasco da Gama discovered the ease of trade for the Portuguese. The Portuguese began to rise in maritime power. The Germans were also obtaining them from there. There are other reasons, apart from the three main reasons taught in our middle school, for their geographical discoveries to acquire spices at a lower cost. It is one of the three main reasons. They set out to find a route from the west to make it easier to find the spices coming from India. You know it as India, where they found the Native Americans. In other words, America. This is the reason why they are called Indians. It is a well-known fact. Indians are referred to as Indians, while Native Americans are called Indians. However, one of the three purposes is to bring spices at a low cost. Because they have this in mind. If we find India by returning via the sea route, we can bring it back by sea, and we won't have to pay taxes to anyone. This is why the English are colonizing India themselves. They should explore a point on both the spice route and the silk road and maintain control over it. At the same time, they should bring the spices at a lower cost. Because in India, there is a wide variety of spices. If you make the mistake of going to India today and not trying the food, you will understand what I mean. The Dutch were relying on the Portuguese until the 17th century. Hey, can we use your ports or something? But when the Portuguese rebel against the king of Spain, they say, you cannot use our ports. Dutch. You know, the Flying Dutchman, Palace of Carabin? The legend of the Dutch begins during this period. In the 17th century, they say, enough is enough, so let's establish our own maritime network. They become so successful that they incorporate many lands, resulting in territories that are multiple times that of the Dutch in the islands and colonies. In 1595, where the Portuguese go, we follow, they send four ships to Java and Sumatra, but the three that are returning are so rich in content that they come back from the colony. What I mean by colonies is that they are actually trading by deceiving. They are making so much profit that they don't care about the sinking ship. They are sending more ships. The king of the colonizer is starting. The English are establishing the East India Company. A single video will follow this. That's it. That East India Company is such an important company in world history. In 1601, the English established this. In 1602, the Dutch awakened. They also founded the Dutch East India Company. Thus, the Dutch and the English begin to exploit the East. They are exploiting the ports of India and its products. The Dutch do not stop there. They also start to exploit Sumatra and Indonesia. What I mean by exploitation is that they give very low quality goods in exchange for things that are actually expensive in Europe. For example, the Dutch go to India to buy cotton fabric. Look, it's very clever. They go to Indonesia to buy spices by paying with cotton fabric instead of gold and so on. At that time, India eventually wakes up and says, we are already self-sufficient. They also make payments for cotton with silver and gold, but they use low-grade metals to cheat. Therefore, they are establishing a network between India, China, Indonesia, and Japan. Why is Japan important? Japan has very high-quality silver mines. They also supply silk and leather to Japan. Thus, they set up a scheme where they buy from one place and sell to another. They buy from there and sell here. They buy from here and sell there. They constantly adjust the prices as they wish, preventing direct trade between these parties. And the Dutch are growing exponentially with the lands of Indonesia. This video is the first episode of World Trade History, specially broadcast for you on this channel. I will be releasing these episodes consecutively. However, I don't want to tire you out by filming it all as a single video. We have seen the spices of world trade history. The next video will be about coffee and world trade history. See you in that video.